on really early. Uh, they didn't know how to really do massive bomb loads. They didn't have anybody that could carry a massive bomb load, so they just never put a lot of energy into determining what kind of bomb that ought to be. And the result of that was that they flew the second blitz over England with externally carried 1,000 pounders. Can you imagine what that was, Drag City? I mean, you're dragging along two 1,000 pounders out there in the slipstream in an airplane that can barely go 200 miles an hour anyway. <coughs> so, in both of these, these cases, the airplanes designed to go to beyond the Urals didn't actually produce an airplane that would do that, but Jumpers' design actually produced the JU-90 transport, which was in fact capable of some extremely long-range stuff. More about that in a minute. Probably the poster child for how to do dumb things in the, in the German aviation industry is the Hinkle 177. Um, you saw in the, in the earlier one that I showed you that there are four separate engines, which is the logical way to do that. If you want four engine power, put four engines on the wing. Everybody else did, we did, everybody did. Well, they took a different view at Hinkle. And what they did is they took two of the engines and glued them together in a V like this. And they had nothing but problems with them from the get-go. It was very aerodynamically refined. It was, it was a good performer. It could, you know, 286 miles an hour for 3,000 miles. It, it, it had some good legs on it and some good speed early in the war. But the problem with it was it didn't have the technical solutions that they needed to work the problems with this engine out early. Uh, it was 24 cylinders in a V like this. And guess where they put the fuel manifold? right down to top of the V. So if you got any little leak at all, guess where the fuel's going? Right on the cylinder banks. And the early airplanes were called the Luftwaffe cigar lighter because they, they explode, the engines burn so fast and so readily, just like a big cigar. The, they, the V1 flew in 1939. Uh, the other problem that this airplane had was a policy problem. When Vever died and was replaced by Kesselring, Kesselring's dictum to all of the airplane designers was all bomber designs must be able to dive at 60 degrees. A four engine bomber diving at 60 degrees. You know, that's insane by definition from anybody who's an aerodynamicist, that's just crazy. But that's what they were saddled with. And so they had to build a structure, the 177, that would take that kind of a load. And, you know, the diving is not the tough part. It's the pulling out at the bottom <laughs> without pulling the wings off. And that was one of the things that they had, had really a lot of trouble with. The A-5, uh, there were 56 possible sources of engine fires that had been researched and had solutions proposed by early 1943. 56 different point sources that would cause this airplane to catch on fire. And they had solutions to all 56 of them by January 43, but they were too late to get into the production surge for the A-5 variant, and the A-5 became the airplane that carried the rest of the long-range war for the Luftwaffe. Uh, in the Little Blitz, uh, they actually started a slight pushover at 430 miles an hour and proved pretty much impervious to even the flak batteries. They could not track them well enough to hit them at that point. 303 miles an hour, 3,400 miles. And this airplane could range, it could close the gap of the Central Atlantic, just like the B-24 did for the Royal Navy and the Army Air Force. It could actually get out there where there was this big hole around Iceland before we got something long range to put out there. The, the subs could refuel at sea from the milk cows, they, they could surface, recharge the batteries without fear of anybody hitting them. And ours could do the same thing. And finally, this airplane had the range to do something about that with a service ceiling of about 26,000. So not bad, very clean, very fast, uh, very long range. And this is the four engine derivative that they should have been building in the very beginning, the 277. 
when they actually got around to doing that, the simple solution, Goering even personally forbade people to mention the name of this airplane in his presence. Because there again, Hitler was interested in how many airplanes do I have, not what, how many engines do each of my airplanes have. And so Goering got a chewing out from Hitler about, I'm not interested in that stuff, I just want mass, I want, I want volume. And so he told, he told the RLM, shut up talking about the four-engine Hinkle 177. I don't want to hear more about it. Uh, again, we got, we got helped, <laughs> very much helped uh, by our enemy in that, set, in that set of circumstances. Eight production airplanes were in fact completed, but by the time they got the completed airplanes out to where they could actually ring them out, <clears throat> in July of 44, the Luftwaffe came up with an emergent, what was called the Emergency Fighter Program. The RF was hammering them so bad at night and we were hammering them so bad during the day that they basically said, no build anything else but fighters from this point on. I don't want anything else but fighters. They took bomber crews and tried to throw them into fighter pilots, except for the Stuka. The Stuka they kept. Stuka was kind of their warthog. <laughs> and it's like they kept the Stuka till the end of the war. I don't know if you've ever re read uh, uh, the after action report <clears throat> of probably the best Stuka pilot that the Luftwaffe had. He started out flying Stukas in Spain during the, during the Spanish Civil War and he flew JU-87s through the entire Second World War and survived. Cost him one leg, but he survived. He was flying operational sorties in 1945 when he was captured in the same Stukas, <laughs> you know, with different engine and different, different uh, defensive armament, but that was about it. And so all of them were, were scrapped. All the all these beautiful, what would have been a nasty airplane for us to try to intercept. You know, things going, that thing is flying at B-29 speeds and at B-29 altitudes two years before the B-29 got into operational service. It would have been a real, real problem for us. Probably the longest range one is this one. This is Messerschmitt's 264, which was <clears throat> called the America Bomber. Um, it basically began as a private venture, whoops, private venture in 1940. And its design was to take off from occupied France and bomb New York and come back unescorted, unrefueled. Uh, the first one used the Jumo 211 engines off the Ju-88, and the second one used the uh, uh, BMW 801s, uh, like the later Ju-88s used. It was destroyed prior to its first flight. This is a picture of it at, at uh, Berlin before it was bombed into destruction, and it was the the first airplane was also destroyed uh, in by a bombing attack in 44. 351 miles an hour, 27,000 feet, 9,300 miles, unrefueled, uh, not too shabby. The airplane that probably, this was such a simple solution, you wonder why they didn't find out beforehand. If you need a longer range, make the wing bigger, put more fuel in it, add a couple engines for more thrust, and you got a longer range airplane. Why don't you just do that? And so that's what uh, Junkers did with the 390. They submitted it in a competition with the America Bomber, um, and it was just a simple growth thing. And it's, it was easy for them to do. The engineering, no, no big problem uh, for them. Early 44, the V-2 version of this airplane flew nonstop from south of Bordeaux to 12 miles short of the Atlantic coast of New York City, turned around and flew home. And everybody in the historical community wants to see the flight plan record <laughs> that confirms that flight. But there's four guys who were operational Luftwaffe bomber crewmen, and they all swore to it. Yep, this happened. Now, everybody wants to ask, okay, if that happened, 
Why didn't you just go the next 12 miles and bomb New York City? You imagine what consternation that would have created in America if they had just, just dropped a few bombs in New York City? I mean, in good grief, we would have had half the fighter force would have been pulled back to the Connors to defend Mother, Mother America. Payload, 4,000 pounds. Uh, range, unrefueled, 5,750 miles. A phenomenal airplane. Uh, my favorite part is that if you add another engine, the airplane gets heavier. How are you going to support that? Well, add another landing gear set. <laughs> so they just stuck another set of landing gear out there. After that, <clears throat> after the Euro bomber program kind of went out, the RLM told all the manufacturers, I want you to compete for what's called the Bomber B program. And that is a step up in technology. I, want, I don't want just a, an old slab-sided transport looking four-engine doofer. I want something that will really advance the state of the art here. Uh, because you guys are capable of it, I'm going to give you the money to invest in opportunities to do that. And the first of these was the Junker 288. Again, a private venture developed by Junkers. Anybody ever tells you that, that American design criteria are designed to specifications given to you by the government? Nope. All of you in this room know that's not true. Most of the time, if we found out something good, <laughs> something we knew would work, we tried to find somebody in the establishment to give us a requirement that met that. It's like the F-117 when we found out, yeah, the daggum thing really is doggone near tactically invisible. And then it became a solution in search of a problem. And a lot of us were working in this industry against criteria which were given to us by huge bureaucratic ensembles of people. And the guys who are really plowing the ground and doing really weird, wild stuff on the outer fringes are people like this. They're just doing it on their own. And usually that results in some stellar stuff. So would Bomber B, uh, developed by Junkers? Um, it had uh, the entire B bomb. The B program was again canceled in June of 43 due to shortages of strategic materials. But they were aiming at a, a twin engine bomber in the 400 mile an hour range and the 1500 mile an hour range at 400 miles an hour. And that's what all these other designs that you'll see here were aimed at doing, starting with Junkers' 288. Focke Wolf did the 199, 191. That's a really clean airplane. You look at that aerodynamically, that's a clean jet. Uh, developed for the same problem. They had remote controlled armament. No gunners required other than in the front, front cockpit, up here in the pressurized cockpit. They looked for 2,400 miles, they thought, at 375 miles an hour. So there again, that's a twin engine bomber going more than 20, almost 2,500 miles with a respectable payload. Uh, they called it the flying power station because there was so much electrons in it. <clears throat> I, every time I read this, I'm, the only thing I can think about is Kelly Johnson, you know, when he was developing the, the, A, the A12 through SR-71 series. One of his biographers said, Kelly would have built a radar that ran on hydraulics if he could have figured out how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> he just loved this stuff. Well, Focke-Wulf loved electronics. <clears throat> if you've ever seen the cockpit of a Focke-Wulf 190 compared to the cockpit of a BF-109, the 109 looks like something out of the Spanish Civil War. The 109, 190 cockpit is really clean. It has one throttle. It doesn't have an ability to adjust the prop. It doesn't have an ability to adjust, adjust anything else that all the all these other things you got to push and pull on in your typical World War II uh, 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 airplane like my Navy on. A guy who flew who flies corporate flew with my Navy on once. He said, "Man, you sure got a lot of things to push and pull on in here." Because <laughs> he flew an electric airplane, you know, just punch the buttons on the MFD and away you go. <clears throat> That's what they were doing here. They were trying to mechanize and electrically power as much of this stuff as they could to get the weight down and to get the crew requirement down. And they really did some good, they had some good 
their performance. You know, 2,400 miles at 375, that ain't bad. The Dornier uh, was the 317. Um, it was basically resurrected in 1941 to compete for the Bomber B. And they built five prototypes, 416 miles an hour at 34,500 feet. We would have had trouble getting anybody up there to, to, to tag this guy. As a, just as a bomber, not as a high altitude recce airplane, but as just a bomber. Uh, that would have been a tall order for us. Payload 12,000 pounds at that altitude. The tactical stuff is even weirder. <laughs> Here's where you get to, this is the one that was on the, the thing that Bob sent around to, to advertise tonight's talk. But, now this is Bowman Voss's 141, which is offset fuselage. Why do you think they did that? It's an Army cooperation airplane. What do you need an Army cooperation airplane more than anything else? You need visibility. You need to be able to see everything around you as much as you can. So you can take pictures of it and direct other people to come kill it. Um, flown in 1938 with step cockpit, and then finally they went to the all glass thing in the middle. Uh, 248 miles an hour, it's for 700 miles. Uh, actually, it was very successful. Uh, it, it looks so weird, you'd think aerodynamically, boy, that's a, I don't know if I'd want to fly that airplane or not. <laughs> that doesn't look like too much fun, but it actually worked. The one that worked best was a little owl or the Uhu. This was their primary tactical FAC, what we would call today a FAC airplane. Uh, the Uhu did a real good job of that. Uh, they called it the Flying Eye. Uh, they built over 800 of them and they operated all over the place. In every theater that Luftwaffe was engaged in, these things were engaged. Uh, about 200 miles an hour for about 400 miles, uh, but very successful. Uh, very simple airplane, uh, very easy to maintain, small engines, good performance. The Fiesel 167 has the distinction of being one of the airplanes that they, they designed for the Traeger Group, uh, which were the carrier air group for the only carrier they were going to field, the Graf Zeppelin. Uh, they had four or five designs for that. This is one of those designs. It was designed to fold the wings up very tightly so they could maximize the number of airplanes in the hangar deck of the, of the Graf Zeppelin. Very low speed hangar potential is amazing. If, if you can see, Fiesler flew this thing descending 9,800 feet over the same spot of ground. It's like a helicopter. <laughs> you drop 9,800 feet and never moved over the spot he started from. So it was pretty amazing performance airplane. They even sold a few to, uh, to Romania. This is, these are the two strike elements for the supposed carrier air group, uh, or the Traeger group. The 109T was a modified of the E1, they increased the, the span by four feet. Uh, they increased the flap travel, they gave it heavier landing gear, of course. Navy, you know, landing gear is always heavier. You ever looked at an F-4 from the Air Force and an F-4 from the Navy? F-4 from the Air Force, about this big around. Air Force from the Navy is about that big around. <laughs> Looks like a piece of eight inch drill pipe. Spoilers, increased flap travel. They stripped the arrest, they put a arrestor hook, catalog, catapult points. They built 60 of these things. And because the carrier never got built, they wound up moving them to Norway so they could have long range to fly from Norway toward the UK, which in fact they did. Uh, the J87C, this is one of the most famous photographs you'll see it in every Stuka book. It came right out of Signal Magazine, the Luftwaffe's primary uh, in-house magazine for all the, all the Luftwaffe troops. And the, the tagline that went with this fake photograph was that the guy flying the JU-87 had been so intent on the target that he pulled out too low and stripped off both of his gears. Now, how he did that without mashing the prop all to hell, nobody ever said, but 
you know, that was the Luftwaffe's way of getting around the fact that this thing all of a sudden wound up in print and they didn't really intend for it to do because the JU-87C was intended to be able to jettison its landing gear in case it had to land at sea and wouldn't nose over. And that's a picture of it actually flying after having done so. The remainder were all used for experimental flying. The little Arado, uh, 195 and 197, it was Germany's last biplane fighter. And they, they suspended work in 1937. Uh, but this is a biplane fighter that could go almost 250 miles an hour. Uh, not too bad. And then you get the really weird ones that were designed to be carried and stowed and run around behind U-boats. Now, probably the most familiar is the little FA-330, the little Fokker, I'm sure this, uh, it's basically an auto gyro. It's not a helicopter. You towed it behind the submarine with a cable so he could get up in the air and see where everybody was that was threatening the sub. Originally, they built the Arado 231 to do that, and it was designed to go from here to that and put this thing into a big, big container on the back deck of the U-boat. That's why its forward wing looks like that. That's not a mistake in the drawing. They actually built it like that, cockeyed, so that they could fold the wings back, both of them, and fit in this container on the back deck of the U-boat. About 300 miles of range, though. Probably everybody knows these photos, because the, the missiles are, are one of those things that you talk about when you talk about weird German airplanes. The Mistel is a simple concept. You take a bomber, you fill it with a hell of a big warhead, and you use it as a glide bomb. And the guy who's driving the train is sitting in a fighter up here with a little joystick controller about the size of this, and he's flying the JU-88 JU with that, including, including controlling the engines once he separates from the airplane. <coughs> Prototype was, a, was an A-4 with an a Fokker or a BF-109F, and they first tested that in '43. There were 15 of these things with an 8,380-pound hollow-charged warhead with a spike extender on the front of it to basically cause a sensor, it's a sensor fuse projective that's 8,000 pounds behind it. It's a heck of a hitter. And the way they did that is they were going to sink ships with it. That was its primary target. They were trying to attend it to sink ships, the Royal Navy ships. And they first used it in the Seine River in July of 44 uh, to attack Allied shipping as it was going up toward Paris. The Mistel II uh, used other versions of the Ju-88 airframe uh, and by, basically uh, was controlled by a Focke-Wulf uh, 190F or an A8, one of the two. Had an ultra long range Pathfinder Ju 88 H4 combination uh, with a Dopa Rider fuel tanks on the top of the, uh, the fighter to extend its range. There were more than 250 of these thought to have been captured after the war. So they didn't have just one or two of these beauties, they had squadrons of them. They were ready, the second group of Kampfgeschwader 200 was ready to attack Scapa Flow on Christmas, December 1944, and there's their airplanes ready to take off. Scapa Flow would have been an easy target. All the battleships and battlecruisers just sitting there at anchor, incapable of moving out of your way because they didn't have steam up. And these guys were ready to go do that um, in December of 44, but the weather and the fact that there was a full moon over Christmas in December of 44 caused them to cancel the op. The missile twos of these two camp group were in fact used against Soviet forces, and this is a drawing of them doing that, against the bridges over the Oder, the Niza, and the Vistula and toward the end of the war in April 45 trying to take down the bridges to keep the, the Red Army from crossing. 
And then finally we get to the really weird, weird bunch. Um, these are two of my favorite Germans. <laughs> I don't have too many favorite Germans, especially among the Nazis, but, the, but these two guys are on that list. They were in fact geniuses. Walther and Reimar Horton were self-taught, aerodynamic geniuses. And they, they created some of the wildest looking performing airplanes of the whole war. They were very docile handling because these two guys trained as glider pilots. Like a lot of other pilots in the Luftwaffe, that's how they learned to fly during the interwar war, war, inter -war years, was flying gliders at the Wasserkuber. They did all these different designs, even that one. That, you can still see this one at the Smithsonian. Uh, I'll show you some of them here as we go along. The first Horton three unpowered, enlarged wingspan version of the two. They then put an engine in it. They flew it in January of '44, uh, and its ultimate fate nobody knows what happened to it. They don't know. The five. Uh, this was that's something right out of a 1930s. Uh, Arrow serial in a movie. <laughs> you know, it's like, wow, look at that thing. You know, Flash Gordon. You know. <laughs> uh, and they built this thing, first twin engine, flying wing, um, made of beech wood, impregnated with synthetic rosin, constructed of synthetic materials called Trollatax, which is what this stuff is that covered the wings. The two pilots flew in a prone position. Again, another trailblaking thing. They had a new flight control system, which basically was, they maneuvered the airplane by rotating the wingtips. So they were kind of like drag evaders, more than they were elevators or ailerons. Uh, piloted by Walter and, and Reimar, it crashed and it was totally destroyed. There's what's left of it uh, in 1937. And the reason was the FCG shift because of where they mounted the engines. Also, look at, the ta look at those props. That's almost like something you'd see on a ship. You know, and the prop was hollow. It wasn't solid wood. It was, it was made of the same stuff that the airplane was made of. Walther lost his upper teeth, but uh, the other than that, in all that mess, neither one of them was seriously critically injured. Only Walther lost some teeth. And then came the Five Series. And Five's probably the most famous of the Walther flying wings. They were conventionally wood and steel tube. <clears throat> first built in 1937. 1937, they were flying flying wings. The pilots sat upright here in this one. The engines were, really, were moved forward to address that CG problem. And in the autumn of 37, uh, Walther flew it. It was derelict at Potsdam in 1941 until Udit approved its conversion to the 5C which looked like that. So they took the B and they changed it all around and it flew in May of 42. Single seater, uh, tested in 43. It was burned up by Allied occupation forces in April 1945. And the ultimate power, uh, it was designed to be powered by not these reciprocating engines, but by the Argus Pulse Jet, which was the same engine used on the V1. Now, if, if you've ever seen anything, any programs on the V1, I would not have wanted to been the guy who wanted to sit in the cockpit of this thing with two pulse jets running behind me like that. <clears throat> but they thought they could get away with that. That's Walther in the cockpit. Then the 7 came along, and that was designed to get Gettingen as a research airplane, powered by the two Argus things, driving two blade props, constant speed, uh, flew February 44, uh, where it was suspended in order to concentrate on what would become the most familiar to us, and that's the Horton 9. Uh, that is an incredibly advanced aerodynamic shape, isn't it? For those of you aerodynamicists here in the crowd, and I know there are a few, that's an amazingly clean airplane. Designed by Hall author, uh, technical information on the Jumo 004 jet which hadn't reached any kind of performance yet. 
Uh, Goering's direction after Milch had officially disbanded the Horton Brothers design team, Goering said, go ahead and do it anyway. I don't care what Milch says. Do it anyway. The V1 was an unpowered glider, very clean, aerodynamically. It was tested at Brandis and Orianenburg and was finally uh, found unassembled like this by the U.S. Army and they burned it. Uh, her attendant jet power was delayed six months by the bureaucrats in the RLM. And what they produced is this. This is the Horton 9 V2, the first jet-powered flying wing airplane to ever fly. Uh, two Jumo 004s right there, you can see them. Uh, nose wheel came off of a Hinkle 177. <laughs> which was kind of odd, and that's why it's so big looking. Uh, first flight, Orianenburg by Lieutenant Ziller, 2nd of February, 1945. The second flight, uh, a day later, maximum speed, 497 miles an hour, recorded. The third flight resulted in a crash due to the inability to control the roll of the airplane with asymmetric thrust when one of the engines failed, and it killed Ziller. That's the only flying picture we have of it that we know of right there. This is the one that's at the Smithsonian. If you've been out to Udvar Hazy, that's, that's kind of what she looks like now. Um, built by Gotha, uh, that's why it's called the 229 a lot in the literature, but it's really the Horton 9. Uh, two Jumo engines again. It had a simple ejector seat uh, in the airplane, uh, armament for 30 millimeter cannon, uh, 607 miles an hour at 52,500 feet. And I don't need to tell you that we didn't have anything that could handle that problem. <coughs> there was nothing we had that we could have used to stop this thing at altitude. It was captured at Frigger Schroeder in April of 45 and shipped to the United States. That's what it looked like when it came off the deck at uh, uh, RAF Farnborough. And you can see it today out at Varhazi. It looks like this. Northrop Grumman went and built a replica uh, just to test it for radar cross sections. And this is the replica they built. It's a uh, Carbon impregnated glue in laminated plywood skins. Plywood, carbon, plywood, carbon, plywood. Uh, in fact, when we went to look at doing the B2, we sent some guys out to Silver Hill and they said, Mind if we look at that Horton thing you got over there? <laughs> we started taking pictures of the, the way the wing was structured. Uh, 25 to 30 percent lower than the signature of then. Germany's primary fighters, the 109 and the 190. At 100 feet, the chain home low radar, which was the low altitude version of the high altitude early warning radar, would not have been able to pick it out of the sea surface clutter. So it could have penetrated chain, the whole chain home business and been inside the radar ring of the, U, of the UK before they even knew it was there. And this is the one I'm going to end with. How would you like to have encountered that thing in World War II? This is their last design, the 13A. Uh, it flew by Her Herman Strebel at Göttingen in November of 44. And they had flew 20 successful gliding flights in this thing. It was designed for a 70 degree, degree wing sweep for Mach 1.4 in November of 1944. Uh, that's what it looked like after uh, a bunch of forced laborers were turned loose from their jail cells and allowed to destroy anything they wanted to on the Air Force where they were imprisoned. But you can see in, in all, in, from high altitude to Army cooperation to long-range bombers, 
to high-speed fighters. Uh, they had they did some incredible work under incredible circumstances. I mean, you guys did amazing work here in the sanctuary of the of the United States of America. They did incredible work while people literally were working in factories that didn't have roofs anymore in February in Germany, and they were still at it. We never broke their will. We pounded the put out of everything they built and everything they were using to build everything they built, but we never stopped the will of them. And that's something we, that was a very great surprise to the strategic bombing survey when they got through looking at the stuff that we had actually produced you know, with the bombing campaign. And that is the end of my program. If you have any questions, I'd like to entertain a few.